Welcome everyone to another episode of the Powerhouse Podcast. I am super thrilled because she is back. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend and the amazing powerhouse, Dr. Manette Ryorden is here with us once again, and we're here as always. Uh, so before I even talk a little bit about what we do on the show and who my fabulous guest is, let me just say hello to my dear friend, Dr. Manette. Welcome. So glad to have you back. On the show. Oh, I'm just honored to be back. And um, I remember last year's conversation being a little teary. And uh, so I'm curious to see where we're going to go this year. I was just going to say, I remember that as well. And I'm looking around and I'm like, I don't have tissues anywhere. So Actually, I don't have tissues either. But you know, messy, it, right? Yeah, maybe we'll just be silly today instead of sad. So who knows? Know it actually it wasn't sad. It was just profound. It, it was extremely profound. And uh, you never know. And that's one of the beauties of the show, right? Um, for those of you that might just be joining or those of you that have been listening for a while, you know that this is a place that we like to just cut the surface shit. We like to go deep. We like to have those meaningful conversations about what it really means to be a leader, how you're choosing to show up in your life, how you're choosing to serve, and how you're choosing to take that personal responsibility. And the conversations can go anywhere. And Dr. Manette is right. Last year, she was on the brink of some really major shifts in her business and in her personal life and the work that she's doing. And it got very profound. It got very deep and it got very vulnerable last year and I so honor how open you were with the you know our guests and the conversation that we had and it did it got very emotional it got very connected and so we have no idea where the show is going to go today and I love that I love that we keep the conversations very open very courageous and organic and so before we jump in because I want to know what's been going on in the last year and I know that there's other pivots that have been happening let me just remind all of you of who this fantastic fabulous powerhouse truly is. Um, let me give you a little bit about her background um, so that we can put some things in perspective. Um, Dr. Manette Ryorden is an award-winning entrepreneur and best-selling author of The Artful Marketer, The Fundamental Business Guide for Creative Entrepreneurs, and Instant Insights, a time management system for creative entrepreneurs. Dr. Manette has over 17 years experience as an entrepreneur and a decade as a speaker. She loves sharing with her audience how to bring creativity, productivity, and profitability to Together to really work for you. Her mission is to empower women to share their creative genius in the world. She believes that we can create global change through entrepreneurship when we claim our creativity. I love that. She's an artist, poet, and writer who is obsessed with coffee. She's even drinking her coffee today, her big ass cup of coffee and dragons. So once again, Dr. Manette, welcome, welcome, welcome. It is, as always, an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. I am so excited to be here and just always excited to see you and connect with you. Excited I got to see you and hug you in person recently. I know, that was so, so delicious. And we were just talking before the show. And in just a few months, we get to play in space. Do it all again, together. yes. And so I so look forward to that because um, I've had the honor of knowing Manette for the past couple of years. We actually played a couple spaces together and i um, just always amazed and um, truly admire um, who she is, how she shows up, and the work she continues to do. So that's exactly where I want to jump in. I know last year was a huge pivotal point for you. And like I said, it got, we got into a place of really some deep vulnerability and a place for you that was almost an announcement type space of where you were going to play and what you were going to do. So I want to talk about what the last year has looked like for you. And I know in speaking with you that you're even on the precipice of a new pivot point. And how is that showing up? And what does that mean for the work that you're doing now? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm reflecting back on last year. It wasn't a great year uh, business-wise. It was a great year personally. It was, um, we tried some things that didn't work. It happens when you're in business. And I realized I need to update my bio. It's hard to believe, but I started my very first business in 2002. So I'm coming up on 20 years wow. of growing that's businesses. Crazy. crazy that that's, that next year is 2020. Yeah. Yeah, and my, my baby, my son, the day that we're actually re recording this is turning 20 today. It's like, whoa. So my, I'm in a very interesting place in, in my life, and, um, and we're pivoting again. So last year, I think, was really a year of personal evolution and personal growth. I did a lot of work around connecting to self, healing old wounds. And I think as leaders, we forget how important it is to do the, the personal development 
work as well as the practical skill building that we need to run our companies or to grow our careers and <clears throat> it was an it was an intense journey and um and worth every step of it right we learned a lot um i think i i realized that i've been in business for almost 20 years and i'm tired um of, of having some of the same conversations and doing some of the same work. And I've been reflecting back a lot. So I owned a, a parenting magazine in the Dallas area for 11 years. And when I sold that, I was so done with media marketing and sales. I'm like, no more. Don't want to do this. I just want to paint and play and be creative and have fun. And ultimately, in my coaching practice, those two things ended up morphing where I was working with creatives to grow their businesses. And I realized that I'm so sick of talking about marketing, right? I'm really done talking about marketing. And I feel like there's more important conversations to be had right now. And they were conversations that I was having with myself, my husband and business partner was having with himself. We were having together as a married couple about to celebrate 23 years of marriage and on the cusp of being empty nesters about a year and a half to go. And so I've been doing a lot of just deep reflection through the fall, November, December, even into January was so ready to hit the ground running in January and got really sick with the flu. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these things always have purpose and meaning. It's like slow down, re-entry is going to be a little more gentle. But through all of this, I've realized that this conversation out around creativity is the most important conversation that I want to be having with people. And it's about connecting to our own creativity, using creativity as a tool for personal development, but also... IBM, World Economic Forum, um, Adobe, and LinkedIn have all done these huge studies. And LinkedIn just put out their biggest study saying the number one top soft skill that employers are looking for and not finding is creativity. Oh, and the truth is that one in four people, only one in four people believe they're creative. Only one in four people. And as humans, we are innately creative. So my own personal journey back to my most creative self has brought me to this place where I'm going to make a stand and stand up and really say that my mission is to make sure that every human being on this earth understands how creative they are. Because when we're all working in our highest and best creative genius, we can solve all the world's problems. Oh, there's so much goodness in all of that. I mean, talk about, wow. I mean, that is a big shift. Um, first of all, congratulations, 23 years of marriage. Congratulations. Thank you. You know, I think it's interesting, and, and it, I, I say this a lot. Sometimes life doesn't throw you one curveball. It throws you the whole freaking, like, batter's cage worth of balls that's coming at you all at once. And I mean, talk about a lot of transition and a lot of things that are pivoting just all around personally, professionally. Um, and I do find it interesting. There's a, a, a clip I pull from YouTube that I use in a lot of my trainings that there's a quote in there that says, you need time to be creative. We were born of and from a creator and the fact that we don't know how to create that space to be creative or have that belief around the fact that we are creative beings first and the fact that I, I find that really sad. I actually find that tremendously sad to think yeah. that one out of four human beings actually even qualifies themselves as any kind of creative space, right? Um, and so I'm curious, I, I've got so many questions around this and I love that you're willing to have a bigger courageous conversation around what creativity really means. Yeah. And so one, I want to really dig in a little bit around, and, and, I, and I heard you say a little bit about, you know, really connecting into your gifts. But when we think about creativity, what does that mean and what kind of spectrum are we talking about? Because I think sometimes people lock creativity into, well, I can't make beautiful paintings like what Manette's got behind her, which by the way, your artwork is gorgeous. Thanks. Thanks. And people are like, well, I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to play an instrument. And I don't know how to paint. So how can I be creative? So how do you extend the definition of creativity into something broader than that? So I'd like to start there and then dig into some other questions around both your journey personally in terms of tapping into that and the work that you're doing now to help others realize that as well. Yeah, beautiful. So it's fun because I've been um, having a lot of conversations lately with people around what the definition of creativity is. And it would be fun to have one of those conversations with you too, by the way. Um, and it's fascinating to hear people's reflections. But creativity, according to Tom Kelly and David Kelly, who are the founders of IDEO, which is one of the most creative companies out there doing a lot of innovation, innovative work, 
you know, they also maintain that we're all creative. They have a, a relatively new book called Creative Confidence. It's brilliant. But the whole idea is that creativity is about bringing out something novel from something that already exists, right? And it has actually nothing to do with art. And I think the biggest challenge that I face in my own work going forward um, and that companies face is really helping people understand internally, how does the company define creativity? So in the business world right now, when they're calling for more creativity, what they're actually calling for is ideation, innovation, and problem solving. And the thing is that all of those are very important and they all require space, which you mentioned, right? We need space to be creative. Mm -hmm. We need time to daydream. And creativity as a soft skill is going to really impact the future of work as we move towards an era of uh, artificial intelligence, right? Automation more than ever of simple skills, repetitive skills, the Thing that humans bring to the workplace that is the most unique is our innate creative abilities. And that may be in the way we connect with people, may be how we're creative. It may be in our visionary ability to see the big picture or those super cognitive people that see every step of the process. Like my husband's one of those people, he can see the big picture and all the steps and it's such an incredible gift. And yet it can get him stuck because there's so many steps usually, right? That you're, it's overwhelming to see all the steps. Um, it's remembering that the sciences and people in technology are so freaking creative. Like a scientist ability to ask powerful questions mm -hmm. and then to be willing to put in the work to find the answers or to ask questions that have no answers. And so for me, at the end of the day, the definition of creativity is asking open-ended questions that don't have answers in order to generate more, better, interesting, useful ideas and to get out of this place of uh, criticism and judgment about ideas where they're good, they're bad, it's pretty, it's ugly, right? I don't expect everyone to like my paintings, right? You know, and so letting go of some of the beliefs we have and the, and the current, um, I guess, conflation of art and creativity as being the same thing, because they're not at all. Well, and I love that distinction. I also love the fact that even in using the example of your husband, we forget that sometimes our greatest gifts can also be our greatest weakness, depending on where they're paralyzing us. I mean, every strength we have also has the opposite side and it depends on and that. That's that responsibility piece of understanding yeah. if you're pushing it too far and getting locked in something that's no longer serving as a gift, but it's serving yeah. as something that's more of a paralysis. And, and I use that word gift because as I'm hearing you say that, it's that space of really tapping into those innate skills, those innate um, qualities and characteristics that make you who you are, that allow you to have that open-ended space to ask questions for idea generation. It's not to say this is right, wrong, or indifferent. This is to say, right. okay, let's keep opening up a space where ideas can turn and flow and, and, and expand and move. And there's a fluidity to it. Right. And I think, yeah. you know, what you're talking about is this dynamic space. And so I'm curious because I was actually going to go a different direction. And because you said that now we're going to, I'm going to ask a different question. <laughs> um, when I think about that and I think about that space of standing in your gifts and I think about, you know, there's a lot of discussion also in the corporate environment around authenticity and integrity and, you know, innovation. And so sometimes I feel like there is a place where they work really seamlessly together and I think there's a place where they get jammed up especially mm -hmm. on the innovation side which sometimes leads to a dollars yes. versus innovation in terms of a free open space to have that creativity be front and center and allow people to be really authentic and stand in a place of personal integrity mm -hmm. inside that space and so I'm curious as you know I start some of these ideas and these words are starting to formulate even in this discussion how do you see those things connecting and where do you see the potential blind spots or pitfalls for those that use these words, say these words, yet aren't necessarily walking the talk? So I think it's really digging into the corporate culture around ideation and safety of presenting ideas without fear of being slapped down, judged, criticized, having your ideas stolen, right? You know, there's so many things in the, the corporate 
experience of dialogue that shuts creativity down rather than enhances creativity. And um, it's funny because it's authenticity and integrity to me are, um, they're interesting terms in, in terms of values, in terms of ideas, and in combined with innovation, like people can really dig into this idea of authenticity. And one of the, so I just want to share quickly the five skills that LinkedIn said we all need, because I think it, they're, they're all about creativity. So it's creativity, persuasion, collaboration, adaptability, and time management. Mm -hmm. And when I hear you talking about what's happening, in the corporate environment, authenticity can cause us to dig our heels in and forget about adaptability and collaboration. And I think where marketing is going, where business building is going, where leadership needs to go, and emerging leaders in particular need to really get this, is towards adaptability and collaboration. I'm reading this or I'm listening on Audible to this incredible book. I just started it called The Fuzzy and the Techie. Oh, I love that. <laughs> about a, it's a guy uh, that was, and that's apparently at Stanford, that's what they call the liberal arts majors or fuzzies versus the techies. And this whole idea of how we have so demeaned, diminished, and made less than people with liberal arts degrees. Mm -hmm. And his call is for more spaciousness for people in the liberal arts in technology and innovation because they bring a different perspective. Having studied Shakespeare gives you a different perspective and a global perspective. So when we look at all of this in the context of why creativity matters, we have to start with looking at as a, as a leader, am I nurturing people's creativity? And how can I make peace between creativity and innovation and productivity in the bottom line? Because right now there's a huge amount of tension. I want you to be creative and productive. And those two things are often at battle inside the creative mind. Yeah. And you know, it's really interesting because even this week doing a training with a corporate um, company that I work with, there was a discussion because one of their emerging leaders actually has a history major when typically emerging leaders in that culture, especially on the sales and service side of the organization is more engineers, more technology backbone. And there's been some disruption for people to say, well, I don't know if this person is the right fit because there's this kind of cookie cutter space. And it was interesting because I think this even opens up a conversation around diversity and inclusion. Because Absolutely. Got, even the models where we're like, oh, we're very diverse or it's, and it was interesting because we had the conversation Sunday night that even in those environments that still have typically that very white centric male they're even not diverse in that subcategory because it's either ex-athletes or ex-military people or it's the engineers or it's a, a structure and there's still a box that they're not even inviting diversity in a space that is saying that they they cater to this whole kind of market mm -hmm. and i think there's a whole leveling up and conversation that starts to happen around the more collaboration you have from a truly diverse perspective and not just male female color race whatever but also that background life experience that, that life experiences those expertise the skills and when you bring in a history major or an art major together with a you know engineer and an accountant you have a very different kind of conversation that has to happen. Because and it's bringing, it's bringing the, the, the innovation and, and creative thinking um, across the board, like having, this is what the D school at Stanford has done. So this is where the accountant, the engineer, the salesperson, the marketer, the designer, right? Like all the people need to be in the room and be part of the initial innovation conversation because they bring that fresh perspective. And well, so I love awesome. that. You, I think you're already cluing into that. Well, then I would think they would have to learn a new language too, right? Because in some cases, I know as being a former change management, it's because I quote, spoke chic and geek at the same time. I'm a mechanical engineer by background, but I was in sales most of my career. So there was a bridge that I could create between someone that's speaking German and someone that's speaking Chinese. Yeah. And how do you create them? Because then I think about some of what we're teaching in the business setting also has to be changed in terms of how we're leveraging the conversation and communications so yeah. that we're starting to create a second language for people that's not their natural innate because a lot of those that conflict shows up because someone is like yeah but this is how i see it and they, they and they're saying the same thing just one speaking in german and one speaking in chinese 
Yeah, so I have a, a, a funny story about that. When I was in Dallas and I had my parenting magazine, I got invited to participate in this networking organization that was all companies serving children with special needs. So occupational therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists, all these therapies. And I went to the first meeting and they were throwing around so many acronyms and I was just so clueless. And, and finally, I just raised my hand and I paused and said, you know, I'm, I'm here to be of service. I'm here to help you guys get the word out, you know, do what I can to support you in your marketing. But you got to give me some common language. And I think that's that, that courageous part and the adaptability part is that we have to just be willing to raise our hands and say, okay, no more geek speak or right. no more creative conversation. Can we get on an even playing field? Because we get lazy in our language is the Absolutely. truth. Absolutely, especially in our culture. And yeah. I, it's one of the things that I teach and I'm so adamant about is you need to have agreement at every turn of the conversation to make sure, because you get a lot of people, especially in organizations that have a lot of people that don't like to rock the boat and there's a lot of group think, you get the head nods and you're like, yeah, I got it when actually the way they define it or the experience and expertise from where they're coming from, even yeah. if on the outcome you agree to the same, how you arrive there is different. And I found that sometimes the how you arrive there causes the biggest dissension and the biggest conflict because there's something inside of that that needs to be addressed because there's a belief system attached to it or there is a... Um, that integrity for people or to your point where they dig their heels in so like, oh, that's against... who and their misunderstanding because they don't take time to get that agreement yeah. that for this context, and I'm always a big fan of putting things into context, right. it spout statistics to me as someone who's taken graduate level statistics and has a Six Sigma black belt in, you know, lean management and other things. When people are like, well, five out of 10, you know, or four out of five dentists say, and I'm like, is that four out of five or is that 4,000 out of 5,000? There's a big difference in terms of the story and the context that you're telling. Yeah. Same thing for those conversations that when you use a, a word or a, a, a terminology, can we, for the purposes of this context, over the next three days and what we're going to be digging into, can we agree that we are going to define it this way? And to yeah. take that pause is everything if you're going to have those courageous conversations to slow yeah. that down. And I love that you're saying that. I love that you're talking about, you know, really dropping the creative speak, dropping the geek speak, drop, dropping the chic speak, whatever you want, and getting to a language where... I like to challenge people and say, if you can't have a five-year-old tell you what you do, you're speaking above them and around them, you're not speaking with and not speaking to them. So try it on a child to say, can they come back and say, they know what we're doing? Because if they can't, you're speaking geek or chic or creative, or you're speaking your own lingo, lingo and yeah. people can comprehend that. It's it's so true. I love that about the about the five year old and finding the the common language. And I think it's so interesting when we start to really dive into conversations around creativity and why employers think they need people to be more creative. And so having leaders define what creativity is in the context of the workplace and all of this they care about the bottom line. I get it, right? This is why companies exist ultimately is to make money. But on the other hand, it's to be of service. And I think these conversations can shift and people get a lot more creative. They have a lot more ideas, a lot more innovative, interesting thoughts when they understand who it is that they're creating for. So often I find that creativity, like everything inside companies gets siloed, right? And so when you have the cross conversation and then you add the human element of, am I creating this for a five-year-old, for a mom, for a busy executive? Am I creating this for a city that's, you know, generating energy for whole areas? Like who is the, the end user of this. And I think so often we get so caught up in just getting shit done and being more productive and driving things to market that what we're forgetting is the human element. And that's the most creative part is that opportunity for human connection. And you and I both know that connection and relationships are the new currency in the business arena. And that first relationship I think is to self and the second one is to the consumer. 
Absolutely. And you know, it comes full circle too on the things that we were talking about even when we started the show. It's around creating that pause for creativity, right? It's that space yeah. for creativity because without the power of pause, none of that happens. And so I love that you talk about, you know, first it's got to start with you. You've got to be able to tap into that because I want to come back then to my previous question that kind of was in my mind. As you, I mean, you've had several pivots and are continuing to have things in your life that are changing rapidly and changing constantly. And so when I think about where we were last year in this conversation, I think about the multiple pivots that have happened since then. As a person, personally, as a leader for yourself, what has been the most, I guess, opening space inside of some of this journey you've been on to do this healing, self-work, um, to get in a space to be very clear that it's not a marketing message anymore. It's really about a courageous conversation around creativity. What has opened up for you personally as a leader and what has been maybe the, the more challenging or the icky or the little sticky stuck bits? Because I think we forget that there's always this stuff that is quite uncomfortable or it feels like it's a little bit of a push. Can you kind of share both sides of that for you as a leader walking through this space? Sure. Um, well, I would say the sticky icky bit is me. <laughs> right? That, you know, I, I am my um, own worst enemy. I'm the one that gets in my way. Um, I'm also in partnership with my husband, who's very different than I am. So, you know, finding, again, just common ground in that relationship. And I am a creative and I love to pivot. So knowing when to pivot and when to stick with it and when have I given it long enough and when am I three feet from gold and I'm giving up too soon. So I think all these things rattle around inside my head and my, my husband and I are both deep thinkers and we spend a lot of time looking at what's happening inside and how that's being reflected outside. And I think my tendency in the past has been to pivot too soon. And yet learning to trust those pivots as well and learning to trust that I'm going down the right path and then marrying that with sticking with it for a while, right? So um, creatives are great at, let's try this, let's try that. I want to do this. I want to do that. And, and figuring out the best way to just kind of stay in my lane. And so what I'm noticing in my, in my pivots is like, what are the common factors that are both moving me forward and keeping me stuck? So I think the more I get to know myself, I've realized at times that being a personal development junkie uh, is my biggest challenge. And in StrengthsFinder, you know, I have learner and input in my top three. Wow. And so I love learning and I love input. And at some point there needs to be some output, right? And so noticing when I'm staying stuck in input in that learner space and that whole, mm, I don't know enough to pivot yet, or I don't, and it's funny, we're talking about courage. So my son and I made these fun little word bracelets for everybody for Christmas and my word for the year is courage. And so I'm um, stepping out courageously into a completely new industry, a new field. It takes courage to step away from what's no longer serving us in our careers and in our business leadership. And it takes courage to let go of the amount of work that I've done, right? And so The Artful Marketer is still a great book and it's still selling uh, four years later and it's not the conversation I want to be having. And so that standing in a new place of if we're always evolving to being and maybe instead of most authentic self, it's being the best version of ourselves that we can be in the moment. Um, and being in, and I often like to think of integrity from the, the Latin root of wholeness. Mm -hmm. And when I'm fully in integrity with myself, who am I being? And from that place of being, what do I need to be doing? And if I constantly go back to my core values and ask, is this pivot in alignment with my core values? Am I chasing a pipe dream? Am I just throwing spaghetti at the wall? So like this constant ability to just ask ourselves these tough questions to make sure it's aligned. And I usually know it's aligned. And this is how I felt about a year ago when I talked to you. It's scary as shit. Yeah, right. Yeah, whatever. Right? Yeah, the moment it scares you is the moment it's probably time to step forward, right? Because if yeah. it's not big enough to scare you, it's not big enough to grow you. And yes. Playing in the same space of the uncomfortable is where the magic happens. 
happens. And so yes. yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I, I, first of all, I love the fact that you're like, know when to pivot and know when to stay with it. Um, I think that's a powerful phrase I want to lock in for most of our li- listeners is know when to pivot and when to stay with it. Because I, I'm like you, I tend to be someone who's shiny, squirrel, creative. I just want to build everything. I have a hard time with the stick with itness. Yeah. Um, I want to create, I want to create, I want to create. Um, maintenance to me is like, no. Um, and sometimes that's where you really do have to lock in and, and create some momentum and traction in that space. Um, and then there's the flip side of taking action at some point, cause you can get into analysis paralysis with all the, the learning and the education. And you also can get into, I'm a learning junkie like you, but from a different perspective where I want to take action on all of it. Like right now, I want to, as soon as I absorb it, I want to put it into action and being able to pull it back. And even though I want to step in that place, knowing that not everybody can go at that pace and yeah. slow that down and be mindful of that and I think you know to have that courage in that space I think that's such a powerful word courage is one of my three words all the time um, because I think there's an opportunity as you get very clear I did the same thing um, a year and a half ago and then even recently did the pivots as well where I was really doing more coaching and speaking than training and realized that training is my passion I want to get in with a group of emerging leaders at the same time so that we can have the courageous conversations that get rich and meaningful and delicious. And at the same time, I've also realized I want to have a bigger conversation about spirituality in the business. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I remember the first time I kind of got that, I was like, seriously, you want me to take what, where? And you get into these moments where these downloads come in. And I even had a client in August say after my three day event, Shakini, that's the most spirituality you've ever brought in. And it was powerful. And to have a conversation around love and soul and how are you feeding both and how are you choosing to make decisions courageously to be whole because I think we get locked in our culture around this idea of balance which I personally it makes my skin crawl yeah there's no such thing I look at it more as a harmony and everything that you're talking about, there's a moving center inside of you that is aligned with wherever you need to go for how you show up in your gifts and your purpose and your light that are you in alignment with where that center is moving? Is that a harmonious space for you? It's not about balance. Balance requires give and take. Balance is this leveling. I don't think we were ever in a point where we were level in all of the buckets and aspects of our life. I think there's a moving target all the time that we need to say, to use your word, am I whole in that space? And am I aligned and in harmony with what's most meaningful to me? Yeah. And it's so funny when I think of balance, I think of my life as a business owner, wife and mom, all at the same time, raising kids, raising businesses, trying to stay married as a juggling act. And if you ever see buskers on the side of the street, I love buskers. Um, And you watch a, a guy who's juggling chainsaws. His focus is only on the top chainsaw at the time. He's not watching everything at the same time. Everything is in motion, but the, the focus is dynamic and clear. And I, I think where I've messed up the most is often putting too much focus on work because it, I love it and not enough on family. I learned that lesson the hard way when I had my, here I am with a parenting magazine, right? And I'm growing this company and managing employees. And it's like, Manette, there's, you know, kids, your kids are spending more time in the office than they are at home after school, which was great that they were there. And, right, they were not always at the top of the list. And fortunately, I have a great relationship with my kids and they let me know it. And then when I started painting and finally having space in this house in California to always have my art supplies out and be able to paint, and I would literally get up with my coffee at six in the morning and paint till dinner time. And my daughter said to me, mom, you painting is just like you working. And it was like, oh, ouch. And it's and how so- that thing that's important in front of you. I love that dynamic analogy of, yeah, because what happens if he turns and looks at the other chainsaws? I mean, yeah. brutal outcomes as a result of that. You've got to keep whatever is front and center, front yeah. and center and be present in that. I think, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said around creativity and presence. Yes. And authenticity and presence. And it yes. takes presence because we have created a culture, especially in the U.S., that is very absent from presence. It's very much a coma, half awake, walking around as zombies. And that presence in itself can be a game changer when it's things like creativity that you're talking about to really help people tap into that. 
Yeah, it's so true. And it's funny with my kids, I see less of the zombie. And I would say maybe this is even true of myself and more of the onslaught of input, right? The, the constant, like it's hard to be present when you don't know what to focus on because you're pulled in well, so many directions. mentality coming at you and there's so much distraction. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but my husband and I are sitting there watching whatever show we're binge watching on Netflix. Yeah, and, I, and I actually have turned the television off, except for now it's baseball season and that's my binge. <laughs> I watch that because I can get sucked into baseball season. Right. But do you have your phone on while you're watching baseball? Uh, Audio books. But again, it still can be a distraction. Yeah. Too much of anything becomes a, a noise. In a yes. Capacity. And how do you filter on? And I was just reading Robin Sharma's 5 a.m. club and he's like, how many, when's the last time you really spent time to invest in a book versus just knocking out another book during the week? And I get caught up in, I read a book a week and I'm knocking them out. And it's, I would just want to keep sucking in information. And yeah. at some point I'm like, and I want to take action on all of it, which means I'm taking action on none of it. None of it. I'm yeah. Distracted by all of the shining objects and all of the rich yeah. and not taking the time to savor the richness of the information that I'm taking in. And I would say that's even true with the shows we're watching. We're both on our phones while we're watching the shows, right? Like the, the input is coming in. Now, most of the time I'm drawing because I love to, to doodle and to draw and I love my Zen tangle. And so, you know, but I find I'm, I'm happier if my hands are busy, then I can focus on one input at a time if my hands are busy. So I think it's finding ways to be present that work for us in this chaotic world, right? In a world where there is an onslaught of input. And I think mindfulness is more important than ever in the corporate workplace, as well as in our personal lives and definitely in schools. But mindfulness doesn't have to look like sitting on a cushion with our, you know, legs crossed and, oh, um, you know, right. mindfulness. It doesn't work for me, right, yeah. No, it doesn't work for me either. Creativity is my mindfulness practice. Walking is my mindfulness practice. And so it's finding, are you a swimmer? Do I remember well, that? I'm not a swimmer. Even not though I have three knee surgeries and Achilles, I've had many doctors try to make me a swimmer, and I'm like, that's not my space. For me, it's yeah. moving it. Like, I'm not a runner. I'm not a swimmer. I personally don't understand why anybody would do the same thing over and over again. I get nowhere. It makes no <laughs> I'm a boxer. I'm a, I need like, that is a creative space for me. That's a Zen yes. space for me because I really get dialed into my breathing when I box. Uh, yeah. And so for me, that's what swimming or running is for some people, but no one. Yeah. I, I knew there was an intense form of exercise that you did. Uh, I just couldn't remember which I like one. the rhythm. I like the dance and I like what I have to do with my breathing in order to be at my highest and most level, which is very much a Pilates yoga. I mean, Joseph Pilates was a boxer first and he actually created Pilates so that he could help his fighters tap into their core more and wow. learn to use their breathing instead of just their, their brawn. So yeah. that he could actually last in a three to five minute round because they were getting tanked because they were constantly just a force right. instead of a true power and your power coming in from me. That's Joseph Pilates created that as a boxer and a boxing coach. I did not know that. Um, so when you get in that space for me, boxing is very much a yoga type because yeah. if you're boxing right, you're coming from a place of deep breathing and cork connection and activating energy throughout your body. Um, a very grounded space for me. And what I love about that is I bet you get incredible creative ideas when you're in that yes. space. Oh, I, in fact, there's times that I literally have to get a, my voice memo or whatever, because I can't write fast enough. I just have yeah. to comment into yes. a, something to just, yeah. blah, 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 blah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's the piece that's missing in the corporate environment when people are calling for more creativity, innovation, and productivity is they're not making space for people to step away from the problem and get a fresh perspective. Like I love this story about Steve Jobs that he had most of his meetings walking. Mm -hmm. I'm a verbal processor. You want my best innovative, most insightful ideas? Take me for a beach walk or a hike, Yeah. right? And that's where it's going to flow from. So I, I think it's remembering to inside. So this is for emerging leaders in particular, and this is part of the adaptability and the collaboration is being fearless and courageous and asking for what you need. 
Absolutely. And oh, okay, we gotta have you come back because I want to jump into that so much right now. And we're so getting very close to actually we're a little over time. <laughs> um, so that being said, um, oh my gosh, we're gonna have you back again. I love these conversations with you. This is why I'm so glad you're back and love, love, love this space that you are so compelled to be in um, big conversations. And I want to play with you in this space a little bit. We can talk about that offline. I was gonna um, say, it's like I'm feeling the birth of a three day workshop coming <laughs> up around tingling and we are definitely going to take some of this offline and yeah. the fact that we do get to play together in June yes in a deep space that allows us to be creative mm -hmm. I can't wait to see what comes from that because I think the timing yeah. is going to be like absolutely delicious and I already want you to kind of think about August 4th through 6th which is my Leaders Empowered Strong Summit. I think there's something we want to bring in just as a teaser for those of you that are getting ready for less 2019. I think I want to look at how we can create a creative play space yeah. um, to let some of these emerging leaders incorporate. Yeah. Uh, flex this muscle a little bit. So just make a mental note. I want to come back and talk. <laughs> awesome. And, and where is that going to be so we can all come play with you? Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's only time to be in Milwaukee because the weather is actually quite beautiful. <laughs> Matt, I will be in like Milwaukee. Milwaukee. <laughs> I'm thinking San Antonio, San Diego. Uh, it'll be beautiful in August. August is perfect Milwaukee. I'm going to be awesome. in Milwaukee next week. And for those of you that are listening to the show, next week is March. It's going to be a high of negative 10. And I am not so happy about the fact that I'm going to freeze my rear end off back up in Wisconsin. However, I am very excited about why I'm going up there. But yes, yes August, uh, actually 6th through 8th. That's the okay. Day. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We will take that offline, but I absolutely want to talk about what that might look like. I'm going to create that space. That being said, and as people are getting really even more excited as we start planting some of those seeds. Um, so for all of you listening, Leaders Empowered Strong Summit, August 6th through 8th, you will see more information come out. Um, hope and pray that I can uh, make this work so that Dr. Manette joins us and just know we're going to do something really rich and delicious in the space of creativity and help you flex that muscle a little bit. As I say that, I know some of you are really salivating because is this woman not just absolutely fantastic? I adore Thank her. You. I love her. Oh, Thank you. I just, your energy and I am bouncing on my seat and just so when I like dig in with you, how can people jump into this space and start having these conversations with you. What's the best way that they can connect with you? So they can definitely just go to my website, Minette Riordan, M-I-N-E-T-T-E-R-I-O-R-D as in dog, A-N.com, or find me on LinkedIn. I'm really looking to build my presence on LinkedIn. So Minette Riordan on LinkedIn is a place to come play where I'm going to be diving into more of these conversations as well. Excellent. And we will have all of that for you in the show notes because I really, really encourage and invite you to reach out and see the work that she's doing big conversations. This is why I love having powerhouses on this show. Cause like I said, we don't do service shit on the show. We dig in, we're having like big game changing, life changing, catalytic kind of conversations that are going to create a whole new reality for us in like three, five, 10 years. Um, just think about what that means. So please, please, please connect with Dr. Manette. She is fantastic. And as we are closing out the show and the fact that we got into so many awesome conversations, um, if there was one thing that you'd like to leave this audience with um, as kind of that takeaway, what might that be? So I want them to really think about what did they love to do as kids that they're not making time to do today? Because most of us were super creative as kids, whether it was building forts on rainy days in the living room or imaginary friends or, you know, I remember my cousins having huge battles in the neighborhood with like whole teams being created, right? And there was all this storytelling that went on around what was happening. So I want you to think back to what was the thing that you love to do that you're not making time for now? Because the seed of your current connection to creativity is to that moment in time. 
I love that. Oh, I so loved making forts. I was the queen of making forts on those rainy days. And I love that because I even tell some of my executive level clients, you know, find three to five minutes to start and find your favorite Muppet or Disney song and jam out to it. Like Bare Necessities or one of those songs that, man, when you were a kid or put the towel over your head and pretend you're the superhero, right? Or the t-shirt, whatever that was, um, absolutely tap into that inner child and your place to play. So yeah. create that power of play in your life. Find ways to tap back into your inner child and know that in every way that you do that it starts with you saying yes to yourself and mm -hmm. destroying the noise noise that's getting in your way because in order to stand fully and effectively in the space of leadership and by the way leadership is a choice and it is everyone's opportunity including yours so when you think about how to lead better how to lead more purposely how to lead more intentionally it actually starts with you playing first and saying yes to yourself in a massively magical and powerful way so with that i just want to say just thank you so much minette for joining us i uh, yes big old part i love you so much um and every time i get a chance to talk to you it just excites me and and energizes me even more and so thank you for the work that you know i'm like bouncing in my chair oh, over here. i'm just like oh my gosh i'm gonna because i was kind of dragging this morning and now let's go right we got it let's take on the world um just absolutely appreciate you on so many levels and just so honored and blessed that you keep coming back and gracing us with your just brilliance and insight and thank you oh my gosh she's such a powerhouse and a soul sister and i could go on and on and on and i'm already over on my time so for all of you listening Thank you, as always, for joining us. We love you. You are the reason that we show up and serve because we know that you have the opportunity to show up and lead in ways that are truly powerful and passionate and purposeful. So please say yes to yourself. Destroy the noise. If you have not subscribed, please do so. And know that we are here for you, sending you all heart-to-heart -heart hugs. Thank you for joining us, and we will catch you on the next episode of the Powerhouse Podcast. Bye. and. Uh, Making a phenomenal day.